This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome on this Sunday morning to the worship and fellowship of Delisle Community Chapel. I'm glad for those of you who have joined us here in the sanctuary and for those who have joined us online. Wherever you are today, smile. God loves you. It's great to be together. I'm glad that I'm not talking to an empty building. It's so much easier when I can see your faces, even if I can't see your smiles. You can smile with your eyes. My wife tells me it's possible to smile with your eyes. Yeah, try that. Everybody smile at me with your eyes. Good job. Thanks. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's enjoy being in the presence of our God today. He loves us more than we can possibly know, more than we can even imagine. Whatever you're going through, Whatever you've experienced this past week, whatever lies ahead in the week before us, God knows, God cares, God loves you, and God will see you through. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you so much that we are in your presence now, that you are here to welcome us, that you invite us to come to you, to boldly approach the throne of grace, as the Bible says, and speak to you as much-loved children to a father. You care for us. You want the best for us. Help us to trust you in every situation of life. And now, God, as we come to a time of worship and of praise, may the songs that we sing bring joy to your heart. Amen. Reading this morning from Psalms 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart. In the council of the upright and in the assembly, great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever and acted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Let's sing together. Bye. 
our God, and I will sing how great, how great is our God. Sing that again. How great is our God. Sing with me how children's story again this Sunday, and this story comes to us from 1 Kings chapter 18. It is titled Fire on the Mountain. So Solomon had a magnificent temple built to honor God, but while building it, he had sinned against God and made God unhappy. Solomon had allowed his people to worship false gods known as idols. The Lord spoke to Solomon, you have disobeyed me, so your kingdom shall fall. But because of my love for David, who was your father, it will not happen during your lifetime. After the time of Solomon, Israel divided into two separate kingdoms because of King Solomon's sins. The north was still called Israel, but the south became known as Judah. The northern kingdom's new king was named Ahab, and he married a princess from the land of Tyre named Jezebel. Jezebel was not a nice person, and she worshipped false gods. She said to King Ahab, I want all the people to worship my god, Baal. Anyone who refuses can be executed. Her husband said, anything you say, Jezebel. One day, a stranger entered the palace. It was Elijah, who was called to be a prophet and to tell the people of Israel what God had to say. To get their attention, God told Elijah to tell King Ahab, who had become known as the bad king of Israel, that God was going to send a drought. Elijah said, here's what comes of insulting the one true God. He will send no rain until you hear from me. Elijah then disappeared, but his words became true. Because of the drought, the people of Israel had no food, and they wondered why Queen Jezebel's God didn't help them. In the meantime, Jezebel had led King Ahab to also worship her false gods, and she began to persecute the prophets of the true God, people like Elijah. Months later, Elijah went back to King Ahab. Ahab pleaded with Elijah, tell me what it will take to bring back the rain. Elijah said, I want a showdown with all the prophets of Baal on top of Mount Carmel. Soon, a crowd gathered at Mount Carmel. Elijah said to them, People, the true God will not tolerate the worship of Baal. Today, we'll see which one has the power, Yahweh or Baal. The priests of Baal will offer a sacrifice, and I will pray to God. Which one will send fire? The Baal priests made their sacrifice, and they chanted, for hours and hours. After what seemed like forever, they tired out. Elijah said, maybe you're not shouting loud enough. Maybe Baal is sleeping, or maybe he isn't even home. Alone, Elijah built his own altar. The people watched. Then he soaked the altar in water. He prepared his own sacrifice, and he yelled, God, show the people of Israel your power. God sent a mighty fire, and even the stones of the altar were burnt to ash. The people of Israel realize how foolish they've been, and a mighty rain came to replenish the land. The true God has revealed his power. What can we learn from this Old Testament story? Well, God is incredibly powerful, but he also gives us so much grace. The people of Israel abandoned God, but he still took care of them after they repented of their sins. Even when we forsake God, he makes the first move to bring us back to him. We will suffer the consequences of leaving him, but God always invites us to come back so he can restore us. He hears and answers our prayers. I want to share with you an interesting concept. It can be confusing to be a kid. When I was a kid, one minute they were telling me to smarten up, and the next minute they were telling me not to get smart. I mean, what's a kid to do? Some kids have more confidence than others. I talked to one child recently and asked him about how uh, his school work was going. Actually, um, he was in first grade. And so I said to him, have you learned everything that there is to know already? And he said, well, almost. <laughs> People who think they know it all can be annoying, wouldn't you agree? 
Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, those of you who think you know it all are particularly annoying to those of us who do. <laughs> I remember uh, many years ago, we were living in Kitchener, Ontario at the time, and the church that we were a part of there had a hockey team. And uh, one of the people who played on our hockey team was a man by the name of Harold Albrecht. Harold was a dentist at that time. And uh, we had gone together to our hockey practice in, uh, in one vehicle. And I dropped him off back at his home. And before I continued on my way, we stood outside. It was a mild winter evening. And uh, we chatted a little bit. And we got to talking about how much we knew. And I still remember Harold taking and, and drawing a little circle in the frost on the hood of the car. And he said, you know, at one time, he said, that circle represented everything that I knew. And I looked around at the outside of that circle, the outer circumference, the periphery of that circle, and I, and I said, you know, I know quite a bit. You know, it's just what's here around the outside of the circle that I don't know. He said, but then I got some more schooling, and I went to university, and, and my circle got bigger. And now I realize there's all this around the bigger circle that I didn't know. And, uh, of course, Harold was an interesting fellow. He later became a pastor and then uh, served four terms as a member of Canadian Parliament, a member of Parliament. But he made a good point that night, and it is this. The more that you know, the more that you know that you don't know. Isn't that a fact? That's the way it seems to be. A man by the name of Buckminster Fuller was the first one to talk about what has come to be called the knowledge doubling curve. Until the year 1900 or so, the entire sum of all human knowledge doubled about every 100 years. In other words, all of the accumulated knowledge of all the people in the world doubled once in each century. However, by the end of the Second World War, 1945, the amount of human knowledge that existed was doubling about once every 25 years. That's quite a change. Now, according to best estimates, the amount of knowledge that is available to humans is doubling every 13 months. Months, not years. And according to IBM, and I quote, the build-out of the Internet of Things will lead to the doubling of knowledge every 12 hours in the near future. The expansion of human knowledge is no longer linear, but exponential. And this knowledge is easier to access than it has ever been before. Once upon a time, the knowledge of the world was stored in great libraries where there were huge shelves of books. And while libraries still form an important function, now you can get access to information simply by going to your cell phone and asking Siri a question. And it searches all those libraries for you and delivers the answer quickly. Your cell phone, that little cell phone you carry in your pocket or your purse, has more computing power by far than the space vehicle that carried the first humans to the moon. Did you know that the encyclopedia companies have ceased publishing books of encyclopedias because they can no longer print an encyclopedia that isn't out of date? It's out of date by the time it gets into print. You need to go online now to access the knowledge. The fact is that while human knowledge is expanding 
exponentially. Human knowledge can never solve the turmoil and the chaos in the human condition. There's a verse in scripture that says, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. I want you to remember that phrase. Knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Isn't that interesting? To be puffed up means to be proud. You know, there's a saying, pride goes before a fall. That is actually an abbreviation of a proverb from the Bible. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit goes before a fall. That would be the complete quotation. Now, I want you to understand, I am not disparaging knowledge. I believe in the value of a good education. I am immensely grateful for the opportunities that I had to attend good public schools. In fact, I was a graduate of the high school directly across the street from our church building. I had a privilege, and I counted a privilege, to have attended two fine Christian colleges and also two respected universities. And along the way, I picked up a couple of degrees. My wife, Ruth, was instrumental in starting two schools in Malawi, which immensely improved the quality of life, especially for the girls in that area. So if you are a teacher or a professor or an instructor of any kind, or if you are a parent, I have great respect for you and for the work that you do, sharing knowledge. If you are a student, let me encourage you, learn all you can. By all means, graduate from the course. Finish your high school. The tassel is worth the hassle. It sets you up for a better life. But when you graduate, your education is not complete. In fact, somebody said, we go to school in order to learn how to think so that when we graduate, we can begin our education. Be a lifelong learner. A day that I do not learn something new is a day that I count lost in my life. And yet, I must say, as I said before, that knowledge alone can never provide a deep, enduring solution to all of the chaos and suffering in human life. In all of history, there is only one human being who ever lived who fully understands the human condition and who has the power to do something about it. I'm talking about a man known to history as Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, believe in God, believe also in me. Although he was as human as you and I, he was and is also the one and only son of the true and living God. There are people who say, I believe in science. I don't believe in God. As if the two were mutually exclusive. They may even accuse those who believe in God of not believing in science, which is just silly. When I was a pastor of a church in Chino, California, we had an older gentleman in the congregation by the name of Sam Locko. I say older, he was probably about the age that I am now. He said to me one day, some people say that science contradicts the Bible, but science doesn't contradict the Bible. Some theories contradict some interpretations. I thought that was pretty insightful. 
Speaking of God's Son, the Bible says, through him all things were made. And without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. God, through his Son, created an orderly universe which operates according to scientific laws. The natural world is clear evidence of God's eternal power and divine nature, according to Romans chapter 1. But of those who refuse to glorify and thank the God of creation, the Apostle Paul writes, their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Those who claim to believe only in science are often among those who deny the most basic of scientific biological truths. For example, they may deny that there are only two sexes, male and female. As someone said, if I had a dollar for every gender they have nowadays, I'd have two dollars and a lot of counterfeits. <laughs> or they may deny the fact that human life begins at conception. I have an uncle, Dr. Keith Still, considered at one point, to be probably the leading obstetrician in Canada. He headed up obstetrics at the University Hospital in Edmonton and also taught at the University of Alberta. And I remember him saying one day, from a scientific perspective, there is no doubt that human life begins at conception. The only thing added after that is nutrition. It seems there is no end to human foolishness. I was reading in the news this week that in San Francisco, there is a move to change the names of schools named after historical figures such as George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. Why? Because those people were obviously flawed. They did not live up to the standards of those who now sit in judgment upon them. Of course they were not perfect. They were flawed human beings, just like the rest of us. In fact, there's only ever been one perfect human being, and that was Jesus. So I got to thinking, if we can only name our institutions after perfect people, we will have to name them all after Jesus. <laughs> Every school, Every university, every hospital, every scientific laboratory, every fine arts museum. Actually, it would be kind of nice, I suppose, if they were all named after Jesus, but it would also be pretty confusing. Remember that biblical phrase, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. You see, God is way beyond us, and he is way beyond any knowledge that the human mind can ever discover. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, the Bible says. Now, it's often said that it's not what you know, it's who you know. Have you heard that? Yeah, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Here's a question, a serious question. If you were to die tonight and stand before God, and he was to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Would you tell him how much you know? 
Would you try to impress him with your knowledge? Or would you tell him that you know Jesus and you love Jesus and Jesus knows you and Jesus loves you? Whoever loves God is known by God, the Bible says. There is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge, the Bible says. You know, there's a children's song, at least I Learned it when I was a child. Maybe, maybe it was sung by the adults too. But it went like this. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. And it's true. Everybody ought to know. People are not influenced to believe in Jesus because of how much you know how much knowledge you possess. You will influence people to believe in Jesus when they see that you love them with the love of Jesus. People don't care how much you know. They only know how much you care. When they see your love in action, they will be inspired to believe in Jesus because of you. We pray. Father God, help us not to be puffed up by what we know. Help us to be humble realizing that your thoughts are so much higher than ours. Your ways are so far beyond us. We don't always understand what you are doing, but we choose to trust you regardless. And while knowledge alone puffs up, love builds up. Thank you that your love has reached out to us. Thank you that your love flows into our lives and through us to others. Help us to be those who share your love with our marriage partners and our families, with our friends and our neighbors, and with people around this world as we have opportunity to make a difference. And so God, may your love flow through us today so that others will see what Jesus is like, what Jesus can do in human lives. And they will be inspired to believe in you and your son, our savior, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.
can see that you're working Even when I don't feel that like you're working Never stop, never stop working Never stop, never stop working Even when I don't see that like you're working Even when I don't feel that like you're working Never stop, never stop working Never stop, never stop working Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you are almighty. You have all of the power and all the authority over heaven and earth. Thank you that you created us, each one of us, in your image. Thank you that you love each person so much. God, we want to thank you today that you are a miracle-working, promise-keeping God. Thank you that you are always at work in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. Today, God, God, we want to ask, too, that you would be with our church during this time. Help us to grow in our love for you and for one another, to be reaching out in the ways that we can, to stay in touch, to express love, concern, and caring. We pray, God, that your church would grow and be strengthened during the time of challenge. And what we pray for ourselves, we pray for every church where Jesus Christ is recognized as Lord. As your word goes forth, God, we pray that you would empower it by your spirit to change lives in our community, in our nation, and around the world. Today, God, we thank you for your word, which teaches us. Thank you for all truth, because all truth is your truth. Help us to learn, and to grow as persons. But most of all, help us to grow in love, to be more and more like Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountains I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name In truth And through the See
words of worship that are sung in heaven. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen.